Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our latest webinar for employers. I'm just going to wait and let a few people get into the room. I can see the numbers going up as I speak. Um, I'll just do some introductions. So I'm Angie Crush. I'm joint head of the employment department here at Thomas Mansfield. And today I'm joined by my colleagues, Meredith Hurst and Joanne Leach. And for those of you who perhaps don't know about the firm, Thomas Mansfield specialise in employment law. We also have other uh, departments that specialise in family, litigation and private client law. Now, here in the employment team, we work with HR teams, line managers, also with business owners who perhaps don't have an HR function. And we provide the full spectrum of employment law support. And today we're going to be discussing how to protect your business from the potential misuse of confidential information um, and unfair competition. We'll be looking at how and why many employers get post-termination restrictions wrong and will help you ensure compliance and effective enforcement of your restrictions. We'll also briefly examine the topic of garden leave. Now, as always, we want these webinars to be interactive. Um, so if you do have any questions, please ask them. Just pop your question in the chat box, um, which should appear on your screen. And we'll try and answer these as we go through or um, at a suitable time at the end. Now, just to sort of get a feel for how much of a, a problem this is or has been um, for some of you watching, I'm going to do a poll. Um, and there's a few answers to this poll, so you've got to read through them carefully. But what we're asking is how many of our viewers have taken action over a breach of a post-termination restriction or confidentiality clause? And the answers are either, yes, well, we've written a letter before action. Yes, we've actually started injunction proceedings. No, we've never had anyone breach uh, a restriction. Or no, we haven't taken action and we have had someone breach, but we just didn't end up you know, bothering to pursue it because of the cost or whatever. So I'll just give a few moments so that everyone can answer that poll. Um, just so that we can see, you know, is this, um, you know, relevant and is it something that you have issues with from time to time? If you don't have issues, it could be because you've got really good post-termination restrictions in your contracts, of course. Um, so some interesting results in that it would seem sort of 75% of you um, either haven't, actually the majority of you haven't had anyone breach a post-termination restriction. 16% of you have had someone breach but thought it's not worth pursuing it. Only 8% have started injunction proceedings and 16% have written a letter before action but perhaps not then taken that next stage um, of injunction proceedings. Um, but as it's ended up, 15%, if I end the poll now, 15% have started injunction proceedings and have had that somewhat um, costly and stressful period of, of actually having to go to court to enforce these things. So turning to the, the topic of discussion, now many businesses, of course, consider their key assets to be information and knowledge. And this can take many forms, things like secret recipes, formulas, algorithms, or lists of key clients or contacts. And given the importance of certain information, it's not surprising that employers will go to great lengths to try and protect it. But there are also businesses that seem to adopt a much more relaxed towards key information, at least until it's misused by an employee. At the end of the webinar, we're going to give you the five golden rules for dealing with post-termination restrictions. But initially, I'm going to ask Joanne to talk a bit about what we actually mean by the term confidential information, because some employers will assume that all business information can be protected. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the case. So, Joanne, can you talk to us a bit about this area? 
Yes, well, the term confidential information sounds self-explanatory, but it isn't that straightforward. The courts have handed down a now generally accepted framework by which they have grouped information according to a scale of confidentiality. This ranges from the highly protectable trade secrets to information that is trivial or easily obtained from public sources, which is not protectable. It's difficult to know with absolute certainty where on the confidentiality scale it is appropriate to place a piece of information, but this is crucial because its place on that scale will determine the level of protection that is awarded to it. Case law has identified four kinds of business information which are on a spectrum of protectability. Firstly, at the highest end of the protectability scale are trade secrets. These can be protected both during and after employment, even if there is not an express clause in the employee's contract requiring the employee to keep them confidential. Secondly, there's confidential information, which can also be protected during and after employment, but this requires more attention when drafting the contract to be able to do so subsequently. Thirdly, there is information that amounts to the skill and knowledge of the employee. This type of information belongs to the employee and can be used as the employee wishes. And then finally, there's public information, which of course cannot be protected. So how do employers know whether something is a trade secret or instead just confidential information? Well, ordinarily, I would expect to see a term in the employee's contract of employment setting out what information the employer considers to be confidential and what the employee can and can't do in relation to confidential information, both during and after employment. However, in the absence of an express written term, confidential information includes information which an employee is either told is confidential or which from its character is obviously confidential. A good example would be manufacturing plans for a Formula One car or a particular recipe. However, this still leaves room for some dispute as to what is and what isn't confidential. The courts have held that in order to determine whether a piece of information was a trade secret or equivalent to a trade secret, it is necessary to have regard to certain factors, including the nature of the employment, for example, the status of the employee, and whether they regularly handled confidential information, the nature of the information itself, and whether the employer had stressed the confidentiality of the information to the employee. So you can see how not having a written term defining confidential information can leave a lot of things open to interpretation. The consequences of not protecting your confidential information can be pretty dire, especially if you operate in a market where there is a lot of competition or similar products. Whatever your confidential information is, that might well be the thing that makes your business successful when compared with others. Thank you. And can you also talk about the what are the obligations on an employee and what's the distinction both during employment and after employment in terms of confidentiality? Well, during employment, the employee must not disclose to third parties the employer's confidential information and trade secrets or use the employer's confidential information for their own purposes. After employment has ended, the implied duty of confidentiality survives only to the extent that it protects trade secrets. The case of Fachenda Chicken Limited and Fowler and Sons is authority for the proposition that confidential information acquired by an employee could be used after employment has ended, unless the information was a trade secret or was so confidential that it required the same protection as a trade secret. There is a question mark over how far an express clause can protect mere confidential information as opposed to a trade secret after employment has ended. In the case of Fachenda, it was held that if an employer wants to protect confidential information that falls short of being a trade secret, he may do so only after termination of employment by including an express term in the employee's contract, which is specifically tailored to cover material that is relevant to the employer's business. You'll also need to demonstrate evidence of a breach of the express confidentiality clause by the employee and loss or damage for the employer 
as a result of the breach. When drafting a confidentiality clause, you should carefully consider whether the scope and type of the information the clause covers and whether the wording properly addresses the individual needs of that business. Template clauses which are vague or wide ranging may be void in their entirety, leaving you with only the protection provided by the implied duty of confidentiality, which may not be sufficient as it usually only goes so far as to cover trade secrets. No matter how well drafted the confidentiality clause, the courts will always expect you to describe with absolute precision both the information that you believe is at risk of misuse from the particular employee and the damage that it may cause. If you are unable to define what it is that has been taken by a departing employee and the associated impact, I would expect you to be refused any form of relief by the court. Protection of information that is confidential is a process that requires careful management. Even then, there is no guarantee of success, but the better the confidentiality clause, the easier it will be to persuade a court that a particular piece of specified information has wrongfully been taken and that the clause should be enforced to protect it. Thanks, Joanne. That's a really useful summary. And I think it really drives home the fact that the more courts can see that an employer has really thought about what they put into these clauses and not just used a standard template and not adapted it at all or thought about what their business needs protecting, um, the more likely it is that they will be able to enforce it should they need to at some point. Meredith, what about post-termination restrictions? So we've looked at confidentiality. What are post-termination restrictions? Okay, well, they are they're specific written terms within a contract that they may appear in the contract of employment or sometimes in an appendix or a separate document, a deed of undertaking. They're contractual terms that seek to control what an employee can and cannot do once they've left the employment. So they're all about what happens afterwards. So you as a business might require an employee to enter into post-termination restrictions at the start of the employment. And that's the most common um, because the post-termination restrictions will be feature will feature as part of the employment contract at the beginning that's offered to the employee. But you might also, and indeed it's sensible to um, offer or revise restrictive uh, post-termination restrictions on promotion. It's also not unheard of, but not as common for an employer to require someone to enter into them when they leave as part of a settlement agreement. In that, that's often more often than not where the employer's perhaps forgotten to have them in the first place. So what the post-termination restrictions are there to do is to prevent someone from competing. And we've had a question about that actually, which I think um, maybe we'll get onto when John talks about the different types of restrictions. Um, also um, stop someone from poaching, so soliciting, actively contacting customers, clients and so on. But also a, a, a further restriction is that that prevents someone from dealing if a customer approaches them voluntarily. Um, so they're there really to protect the business and to protect them also from working for a competitor. But as we'll find out, um, they're not as readily upheld the, the, the non-competes. So you shouldn't underestimate the value of having um, well-drafted post-termination restrictions in place. They can be crucial in avoiding loss of customers, suppliers and key members of staff. And I didn't mention that one, um, non-poaching of, of employees. One thing that the poll showed is that those that pursue injunctions are in the minority. And the reason for that quite often is because there's a it's high stakes option. There's a lot of costs involved, but it can be equally costly and frustrating to find that your perhaps senior sales director has walked away with a lucrative client database. Um, so the purpose of today is to help you understand why it's important to have properly drafted uh, restrictions in place. Because whilst one hopes never have to, to seek an injunction or sue an employee, um, sensibly drafted restrictions can uh, amount to a good deterrent, a powerful deterrent. Um, and more importantly, if enforceable, um, the courts will uphold them, whereas if they're, they're not enforceable, the courts um, will reject them and you won't be protected when it matters most. Thanks, Meredith. And yes, of course, although the, the purpose of having these restrictions drafted in the best way possible is to make sure you can enforce them in court 
you know, if you need to, most people will end up instructing a solicitor to advise, are my restrictions enforceable before they go to that court stage? And if a solicitor, you know, looks at them and says, well, actually, these are pretty well drafted restrictions, and I think you will be bound by them, it's far more likely that that employee will, will then refrain from um, pursuing whatever conduct it is they're not allowed to pursue. Whereas if they get advised, well, no, these are sort of so generic, you know, they're probably not going to be enforceable, then they're just going to continue with that course of conduct and think, well, that, you know, I'll, I'll try my luck in court. So there's a sort of double purpose to it. And why do employers impose these post-termination restrictions, Meredith? Well, first of all, I just want to reflect on what you said there. It's a misnomer to assume that post-termination restrictions are not enforceable as a general principle, but it does all come down, come down to the drafting. You can guarantee that if you write a letter as an employer, what you'll get back is a letter from their employer, from their, from their lawyers, um, challenging. It isn't always the case that um, restrictions are, um, are enforceable. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. What's important to note is that employment restrictions can be more difficult to enforce than other general commercial restrictions in, in commercial contracts. Um, that's because of the relative inequality of the bargaining position between employer and employee. But what the court will take into account um, is the individual circumstances when determining reasonableness and factors that are relevant to include, that, that include, for example, the employee's seniority, so how, mu how much influence they had, their status, and whether they were involved in negotiating the restrictions themselves. I mean, that's not that common, but it can be relevant. Generally, the more senior the employee is, um, the more likely it is that restrictions, for, for example, of a lengthy time period will be upheld. So we have a case, um, there are several reported authorities, um, but as you can imagine, that they're, they're not that numerous because not, not a lot of these cases go to court. But the case of Thomas and Farr PLC, that was a court of appeal case, which upheld a 12 month non-compete so that was a clause that said that thou shalt not work for a competitor at all. Um, a 12 month non-compete restriction in a managing director's contract was found to be um, enforceable because that managing director uh, was privy to all major and strategic operational decisions made by the employer and had overall responsibility for all of the company's existing business. It's probably quite an unusual case in the sense that it was quite a broad brush approach. Um, Another really important thing to bear in mind, um, which is often overlooked, is that the reasonableness of post-termination restrictions is judged at the time that the clauses are entered into by the parties. So if a post-termination restriction is considered unreasonably harsh for a junior employee, junior salesperson, for example, it doesn't become reasonable later uh, just because that person happens to be promoted to senior sales manager or, let's say, a sales director. In other words, the employee doesn't grow into the restrictions with time, the more senior they become, they would need to enter into new restrictions that were befitting of their seniority. So you always need to ensure that your restrictions are appropriate for that person and updated um, to account for career progression. And I'm sure um, many businesses don't appreciate that. Obviously, as with all things in our profession, reasonableness is assessed on a case by case basis in order to be reasonable, post-termination restrictions should be tailored, and that goes back to the point about confidential information as well, to the specific employee and the business and the parts of the business in which they operate. And remember that the burden of proving that a particular restriction is reasonable falls on the party uh, trying to enforce it. That's, so that's us, the employer. And you'll need to be able to show that a particular uh, post-termination restriction provides adequate protection that doesn't go beyond what is necessary uh, to protect your legitimate business interests. Thanks, Meredith. And um, you've sort of talked about reasonableness now. I'm just going to rewind a bit because you mentioned legitimate legitimacy. So what interests can an employer legitimately protect by using post-termination restrictions? Because, you know, it's not the case that they can just protect anything, is it? So what interests can they legitimately protect? 
So I think this is Joanne, isn't it? Um, or is it me? Well, I've sort of gone back a bit um, to yeah. um, the sort of legitimacy question. And yeah, um, well, you know, it, I well, think. Yeah, well, yes, um, well, 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 I mean, it's a quite. It, um, we'll, we'll get into sort of the nuances of drafting, but legitimate interests are those which, um, well, in terms of material interest, you've got to you've got to demonstrate that that what you're limiting is those things, those parts of the business with which the employee has been materially involved. Um, yeah, and I suppose what I was thinking about was that you know an employer can't just impose a restriction on someone. You know, simply because it doesn't want an ex-employee to compete in any way. Yes, that's um, right. But it can uh, seek to protect to prevent the individual from using or you know damaging something that does legitimately belong to it. And so yeah. the employer sort of has to look at the nature of its business, the employee's position in that business, um, and you know yeah. really whether they can do any damage really or if they're just trying to sort of unfairly keep them out of the market um you know say for example in a recruitment business um you want to protect your confidential information your sort of candidate database and you'll also want to protect your trade connections um and you'll also want to protect the team that you've got there remaining and those are all legitimate interests to protect but it's not necessarily the case that you can you know, just sort of protect, you know, other intangible things to sort of stop someone being able to simply compete against you yeah. unless they've had some sort of unfair advantage by, you know, the the knowledge and, and contacts and everything that they've made during their employment with you. That's right. Um, and, I mean, there, there's always disputes about this, aren't there? And so... Um, mm. I guess you know what what is reasonable to protect in that situation. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yes. Well, in relation to legitimate interest, you should seek to ex impose a restriction which is no wider than reasonably necessary. And we often get asked that um, well, the broader the restriction, the wider the clause, the better. But that that's actually wrong. The opposite is true. So you've really got to drill down and and, and focus. On, on the specifics. And that will involve limiting not only the restricted activities themselves or defining what the restricted activities are, but also the period um, during which the restriction is imposed. Perhaps also so the ge geographic extent of the restriction, if that's relevant and appropriate. Failure to do so can result in the covenant being treated as void for having too wide a scope uh, because there are some limits on how you can restrict an employee. The basic legal principle that employees should be able to pursue a career in ways that they choose, um, and that's sort of the, what we call restraint of trade, that the restriction shouldn't be in restraint of trade. It is seen in the public interest and in the interest of the general economy that uh, people can develop their careers and skills and experience and move between employers, and that employers can recruit and make use of the best people and create healthy competition. So because of that, to use an exaggerated example, if you have terms that, for example, say, um, an employee can't work for another company in the industry ever again. Well, that clearly won't be enforceable. While we've mentioned the deterrent value um, uh, of post-termination restrictions, that doesn't mean you can apply a broad brush, as I say. That's because the broader they are, uh, the more unreasonable the restraint on the employee is likely to be, rather than a legitimate protection of the core parts of your business. So what we talk about is those parts of the business with which the employee has had a material involvement, for example. So in effect, the test of reasonableness requires a balancing exercise to be carried out between the interests of your business and the individual's right to freedom of movement and to earn a living. Uh, and various general principles have developed as to how the courts will apply this reasonableness test to uh, post-termination restrictions. Thanks, Meredith. And moving on now to look at the different types of restrictions. And we, we have a question, as Meredith said, about this. Um, the most popular or controversial, depending on how you look at it, um, is the non-compete restriction, the one that says you just can't work for a competitor. So, Joanne, could you talk to us about when a non-compete restriction might be justifiable and just how far it can go? 
Mm. Well, of course, a non-compete is going to be loved or hated, depending on what perspective you come at it from, whether you're an employer or an employee. And that's because it has such a significant impact on an employee's next career move. It says that, as you just referred to, you, you are not allowed to work for a rival employer at all after you leave employment. So that's why, generally speaking, courts are not very willing to uphold these clauses as compared with other types of restriction. But that's not to say that it will never do so. The courts recognise that sometimes other forms of protection, such as non-solicitation clauses, can't always be effective in safeguarding a former employer's interests. For example, where an employee could get a colleague to solicit customers on their behalf, or if it is inevitable that that employee will be able to use certain information in any future employment. In this case, a restriction against carrying out the activity at all is more realistic and therefore easier to police. The recent case of Law by Design and Ali provides a useful analysis of the reasonableness of non-compete restrictions. In this case, a post-termination non-compete clause for 12 months duration prevented an employee from being involved in any capacity with any business concern, which is or intends to be in competition with any restricted business. And this was upheld. Restricted business was defined as those parts of the company with which the employee was involved to a material extent in the 12 months before the termination of their employment. And this wording is very common. I see this come up a lot with my clients. The High Court in that case noted the operation of the restriction was limited to parts of the firm in which Ms Ali was involved to a material extent before her departure from the firm. This device ensured that the restriction was reasonable in the scope of its operation. So if Ms Ali was not involved in parts of a business to a material extent, then the restriction was not operative in relation to those parts. If Ms Ali was involved in such parts of the business to a material extent, then the restriction would bite. But that is because it would be reasonable to restrict her from joining a business which competed with those parts of the firm's business. In relation to its duration, 12 months was held to be reasonable as opposed to a duration of six months, because 12 months would be reasonably necessary in this particular case to find, successfully recruit, train and integrate a lawyer into a small firm working in a niche area in Manchester. So we should note here those particular circumstances. Miss Ali specialised in providing employment law advice, but to NHS clients. The contract, including this non-compete clause, had been agreed between the parties as recently as 2021, less than four months before Miss Ali resigned. Ms Ali was an experienced employment lawyer who had often been involved in drafting employment contracts, albeit that NHS employment contracts don't tend to include non-compete provisions as such. She understood the meaning and implication of the non-compete provision in her contract, but nevertheless drew up and distributed a business plan which revealed her plans to do exactly what the clause sought to prevent her from doing namely working for a direct competitor of the firm, which was a position that she subsequently accepted. The court accepted that in the circumstances of this case, the non-compete provision was a necessary and practicable solution to the difficulty of policing and enforcing the confidentiality provisions or other restrictions in both Ms Ali's employment contract and shareholder agreement. The employer otherwise wouldn't have benefited from protection of its legitimate business interests. So ultimately, it's beneficial if employees are aware that there's no reason why a properly drafted non-compete that is reasonable will not be enforceable, no matter how unfair that they may personally deem it to be. It seems sensible to advise employees to take their own legal advice at the time of entering into the restrictions, and also to ensure that there is consideration in return for the employee agreeing to the restriction, either by way of a job offer or a promotion or pay rise. There's a growing trend for employers to agree at the time of entering into restrictions to pay the employee a monthly payment in lieu of salary during any period of restriction in which they are prevented from competing with the employer to compensate them for their inability to earn a living elsewhere during that time. This may increase the chance 
of the restrictions being held to be reasonable and therefore upheld by a court in any proceedings for injunctive relief or claim for damages against the departing employee. Thanks, Joanne. Yes, it's quite um, interesting how I would say it's probably in the last year we've started seeing, um, particularly in uh, companies in the finance sector, paying people to comply with restrictions. So it's definitely, a, you know, a developing area that is. Um, and I guess it's a good time to sort of just, I guess, uh, deal with the question that came in, which is whether it's ever worth pursuing someone who leaves and goes to a competitor with, say, a six month non-compete clause. Um, I guess my my view would be, I mean, it's certainly possible, as the case of law by design shows us, um, but it will probably depend on a number of factors. You know, in that case, there wasn't an immediate replacement to pick up the work. So it was going to be inevitable that some work would be lost elsewhere if this person was able to pick it up elsewhere. Whereas if, for example, a, a business has someone to come in and, and hit the ground running to, to do the work, it might be that they're not really going to suffer a loss, and it, especially if they've got other clauses that stop clients being taken, that they've got enough protection through that route, for example. Um, but, you know, there will be cases where simply by someone being in a different company will affect your reputation your standing and then it will be reasonable to keep them out and I think you the business needs to think about well what what are we going what's our loss going to be here how are we going to quantify that when it comes to it if if we need to yeah. um, so hopefully that's answered that question yeah I mean I just I just add that um, I mean courts don't as readily uphold non-competes <laughs> and that clause it says you can't go and work for a competitor if You've got adequate protection in other areas, for example, confidential yeah. information. And as Andrew said, if you've got a, a, an enforceable and properly drafted non-solicitation and non-dealing provision, what, what are you as the employer really concerned about here is not your business, not losing the, the, the lifeblood of your business, the customers and the clients that, that pay pay you. Um, so stopping someone working all together, if you've got a well-drafted non-solicitation might not be seen as re as reasonable and it is probably the most draconian tool in your armory as an employer the non-compete so as i say mm -hmm. depends what are the tools you have um, but yeah thanks Meredith. and okay. um, another question that that came in was whether it's okay to have these restrictions in a handbook as opposed to a contract of employment um now in this particular case um it the question says that the employment contract states that the staff handbook is incorporated as part of the terms of employment. I mean, that sort of raises other issues because you don't really want your disciplinary policy, et cetera, being um, you know, a contractual term. But if they are incorporated, then you, you can have them in a handbook. I have to say, personally, I'd rather see them in the employment contract because then it it shows that you've thought about them in in relation to that particular employee rather having blanket provisions that apply to everyone. Um, so it, it shows that you've given more consideration to them for that particular employee. Um, also, you know, you know that they will have seen it because half the people don't read the handbook, which isn't necessarily a problem. But it's all these little factors that I think mean I'd rather have it in a in a contract or in a separate deed that they sign. Um, it's not to say they're not enforceable, but I think it would certainly be preferable, especially if you've got anyone that really is key that, you know, you need to be sure they're complying with these. Um, I'd try to look to get something signed in addition to just having them in the handbook um, and something that Meredith I think I'm going to ask him about later may also explain that the thing of looking at the restriction at the time you enter into it. Um, so moving on um, Joanne to other types of restrictions that are available to an employer so we have looked at the, the most draconian the non-compete um, what other restrictions are available either in addition to or instead of a non-compete? 
Okay. The second most popular type of restriction is the non-solicitation clause. We usually see this in relation to clients, customers, and also potential client customers of a employer. Solicitation, we mean the ex-employee actively contacting a customer or client, that is making the initial approach with a view to obtaining their business. So the purpose of this clause is to provide, try to prevent the departing employee from doing this and taking those clients or customers or potential clients and customers with them to the new employer. It's generally OK for an employee to inform clients and customers that they're leaving. However, there's, there's quite a fine line between acceptable communication and unlawful solicitation. At the very least, solicitation seems to require some kind of invitation to transact business and an intent to do so. But this can take many forms. And personally, I've seen accusations of a breach of non-solicitation clauses just through status updates on social media, such as LinkedIn, which refer to the name of the new employer. So, of course, whether there have been a breach will depend on the particular wording that's used in any given post. Generally, a clause should be restricted to customers with whom the employee had some contact during the specified period before termination. And other factors may include, as we said earlier, the employee's level of seniority in the business, the extent of their role in securing new business is also relevant, the loyalty or otherwise of customers in the relevant market, and the length of similar restrictions in the employment contracts of competitors. And what about if a non-solicitation clause, and just to explain, because we had a question about this, whether non-solicitation was just about in poaching employees. So um, there's sort of four um, categories in, in that sort of scale that Joanne mentioned earlier. You've got non, a complete non-compete and not, you know, not going and working for another business that's in the same sector. You've got non-solicitation of clients, customers. You've got non-solicitation of employees. And you've got non-dealing with customers and clients. So non-solicitation, there'll be two different type of clauses, one that covers you know, your other staff and one that covers your you know, clients and customers. Um, so, Joanne, what if a non-solicitation clause and talking now about you know non-solicitation of clients and customers what if that isn't enough for the employer but they don't really feel they can go as far as a, a non-compete clause so that's where your non-deal clause comes in um, these can follow on from might be used in conjunction with non-solicitation clauses uh, your justification threshold here will generally be a little higher. So this type of clause seeks to prevent an ex-employee from working with a client or customer where the ex-employee doesn't take any active steps to contact that client. It might be that the client approaches the individual. For example, if you run a recruitment consultancy and one of your consultants has recently moved to a new employer and one of your candidates follows that departing consultant to their new employer, your non-dealing clause, you could try to use that to prevent the consultant from working with that candidate at all in the business that they've moved on to. Now, this has got some advantages because you don't need to prove that the ex-employee made that approach, but it does significantly broaden the prohibition on the ex-employee and also affects the rights of third parties, such as the new employer. So courts are generally a bit more cautious about upholding them. The justification threshold for a non-deal clause will therefore be higher than for a non-solicitation clause. And a non-dealing clause won't be enforceable if it prevents any contact with the relevant business contacts. The restriction must be focused on contact that would prevent, for example, um, that damage occurring to the employer's business. So if you had a non-dealing clause that prevented a financial advisor from using a former client as a recruitment consultant, well, this came up in the case of Dunedin Independent PLC and Welsh, this was found to be unenforceable. So the court held here that the restriction could only have prevented the advisor from providing financial services to the recruitment consultant, whereas they were free to engage that consultant's services to assist with a job search.
Thanks. Yeah, it shows the importance of really looking at what it is your business needs protecting from. Um, in in the non-deal clause, I often come across a, a situation in the insurance sector. It, it seems to be particular in the insurance sector where um, as a very senior uh, employee will say, will have a non-deal clause saying you can't deal with any sort of customers, suppliers. And they'll say, but in the in the sort of reinsurance sector, the act, the whole nature is that you spread the risk. So if I go to another um sort of reinsurer I will be dealing with the same people because we're always spreading the risk and we're all, we're all dealing with the same people and it's not going to affect my previous employer's business in the least because you know this is the nature of the business you have to spread it out and everyone deals with the same people and so in those situations you can see that it's very unlikely that clause would be enforced if it was a very generic clause because you, you really can't see how it will damage the um, the, the former employer um, for them to just continue doing what the whole industry does. So it just shows how important it is to think about your particular industry and making sure your clauses are, are tailored towards your business, what you need protecting, uh, and make sure that it's not going to be unnecessarily restrictive. And then we come on to sort of solicitation of your remaining workforce, Joanne. So how do employers protect that side of things? Well, yes, this is where you have non-poaching of staff clauses in a contract of employment, where you're seeking to prevent a former employee from taking their colleagues with them when they go elsewhere. So an employer is entitled legitimately to protect a trained and stable workforce, not least because of the cost of having to replace staff, but also the damage to the business that can result from further staff leaving, particularly in highly competitive or specialised industries or where an employer has got very few employees to start with. So when the employer drafts the non-poaching clause, it's important to consider how long after termination the outgoing employee's influence over their colleagues will continue. The scope of the classes of employees over whom they will have that influence is also relevant. There's other types of post-termination restrictions as well, including non-interference with suppliers of the business, but the ones that we focused on already, they tend to be the ones about which employers most commonly seek our advice. Thanks, Joanne. Now, there are some common pitfalls we see with post-termination restrictions. So, Meredith, it would probably be helpful for our viewers if you could briefly touch on these. Indeed. Well, the, 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 the biggie is don't breach the employee's contract. It's easier said than done if you don't realise you've necessarily done it. But So, during the employment, you don't want to conduct oneself in a manner that's either calculated or likely to seriously undermine the relationship, so-called constructive dismissal. Because if the employee resigns and asserts constructive dismissal um, successfully, that can mean that the contract is broken. And that also means that the post-termination restrictions are unenforceable. A breach of contract can also arise, I suppose it's a theoretical question, but if you terminate summarily, in circumstances that you consider to be gross misconduct, um, but the employee disputes that. There may be an evidential dispute there as to whether the employee's conduct was so serious as to warrant dismissal without notice. But if it is found not to be sufficiently serious, then again, the employee may be released from post-termination restrictions. So take care when terminating in that way. Um, another inadvertent issue or pitfall that we we see is uh, where you're terminating um, by making a payment in lieu of notice so that's where somebody leaves immediately but you effectively buy out their notice pay when you're doing that but you don't have the express or written contractual right to do so because there's no clause in the contract i have to say that's unusual now not to see payments in lieu of notice clauses in contracts but if the contract doesn't contain such a clause um, allowing you to terminate immediately and you go on and do so, then again, that is technically a breach of the contract and that will mean that the post-termination restrictions are invalid. 
Um, and another really important thing is to check pylon clauses very carefully. Now, the majority of them will say that the employer will only pay base salary and will not pay benefits and so on. But, so they usually are limited in that way, but sometimes that clause will provide for payment of benefits as well. So inadvertently failing to pay, um, let's say pension contributions or commission or something of that sort, um, could lead to that payment and live notice clause being breached and could amount to a breach of contract again meaning that the post termination restrictions fall away um, remember and this is a really important point particularly when offering new restrictions on promotion that they're not enforceable um, unless accompanied by some form of consideration usually money um, that's not likely to be a problem at the start of the employment because you offer a job with a package of salary and benefits and so on but it can present a problem, as I say, when updating uh, restrictions during the employment, they have to coincide with some form of promotion or an offer of consideration, pay rise and so forth. Um, and as well as that, you sometimes will see, you know, the right to participate in a bonus scheme and equity stake shareholdings, that sort of thing. Um, but if there isn't consideration, then potentially they're not enforceable. Of course, as always, each case, um, it depends on its own facts in that scenario. Thanks, Meredith. Yeah, it's um, it's really important to know that, um, you know, you don't grow into a restriction. You have to look at that restriction at the time you entered into it. And you can't, you know, you, if someone starts off as a very junior person but ends up senior, the, the restrictions might be OK for that senior person. But they weren't if they weren't when they were a junior person you're going to lose the ability to rely on them. So you have to make sure they're constantly reviewed and updated. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that, that is a good point, actually. I mean, I've had a couple of businesses who've wanted to update their restrictions and promulgate them to everybody um, and get everyone to sign them and send them back. And I've said to them, look, that you can do that. But if you drill down and find that there's no consideration at that time, that there's no accompanied uh, financial incentive they're maybe not worth the paper they're written on. It, yeah. It'd be a good, it'd be a good um, deterrent, uh, but perhaps little else. It seems mm -hmm. like Joanne has left the room here, but um, we'll carry on the two of us and hopefully she'll <laughs> return. Um, just, we have a couple of questions come in, so I'll just address, address those for the time being. Um, someone asked, well, if you get a settlement agreement situation, which obviously is so common, does that overrule the contract of employment? And what I would say is, I mean, generally, yes, it will, because it will have a clause that says, you know, this is the entire agreement, um, you know, no other, uh, you know, contracts or, you know, statements or emails or anything are enforceable. Um, but I think it's always good practice in the settlement agreement to just address what happens with the restrictions. So if there are previous restrictions, just met, say they will remain in force. If you're amending them in any way, say that you're amending them. If someone's signing up to new restrictions in a settlement agreement, then you probably need to provide some consideration for that for various reasons. But um, although settlement agreements will generally override them, if they just say nothing about the restrictions at all, then it may be... It, you know, depending on how the settlement agreements work, it may well be the case that the restrictions in the contract of employment live on anyway. Um, and then another question about whether constructive dismissal can only be claimed after two years of service. The answer is yes, it can. Um, it's the same as an unfair dismissal claim, but of course it's still subject to the usual exceptions to the two-year rule that apply for unfair dismissals of health and safety asserting statutory rights, whistleblowing, all of those um, sort of areas, you still could be at risk um, under two years in those scenarios. Yeah, and there's also possibly a grey area in respect of discrimination, because in the Equality Act, the definition of dismissal, <coughs> constructive dismissal, is transposed into the Equality Act as well. So you can find that someone could resign for what they consider to be discriminatory reasons on the part of the employer. Um, that would be open to to challenge possibly, but it's something to be mm. to bear in mind because, of course, you don't need qualifying service for discrimination claims. Mm. 
And I'm, I'm conscious of, of time and want to try and sort of make sure we get through some of the important points we've got to cover. So I'll ask you briefly about garden leave, Meredith. Yes, of course. Um, What's the aim of garden leave for employers and how can that be used to complement restrictions? Indeed. Well, garden leave, um, um, people talk about garden leave in the context of paid suspension during employment, but that's sometimes a misuse of the term. Garden leave is when you've served notice um, and it's to keep the employee out of the business, out of the marketplace, um, long enough for any information they have to become stale, go out of date. That might be relevant in sort of tech industry and so forth or, or for the em- Employees successor to establish themselves without interference from that person, particularly with customers, and so as to protect goodwill. So it's a good tool that you have to stop someone operating, if you like. Um, in most cases, you can only place an employee on garden leave if there's a written term in the contract, uh, and that will usually stop the person coming into work, um, contact, contacting customers and staff. So it can be a useful uh, tool in the armory during the notice period. Mind you, it's muted, I believe. But um, if I <laughs> does it have does it have sorry does it oh, have okay. an effect on post termination restrictions if someone goes on garden leave? Well, it well it does. Um, the main point to note is that is if someone has been on garden leave for the entirety of their notice period, particularly a long notice period, a court might take this into account when determining how reasonable the length of a subsequent post termination restriction is. Um, indeed, some non compete clauses specifically provide for what we call the principle of offset. So in other words, restrictions are reduced uh, by the length of time spent on garden leave. And a court may be more likely to consider a clause drafted in that way as uh, being more reasonable. So in in a case of Credit Suisse Asset Management and Armstrong, however, the employer um, sought to enforce a garden leave provision of six months. So the individual was on, um, on, on garden leave during the whole of their notice period. And then uh, followed by a restrictive covenant or post termination restriction of a further six months. So meaning that they were out of the industry for 12 months. Now, the employees, and there was several of them in this case, argued that the restrictive covenant, um, the post termination restriction should be offset by the six month notice uh, spent on garden, even effectively reduced to nothing. Uh, The court disagreed. Um, saying that there was no automatic principle of offset. Obviously, the, the clause wasn't drafted in that way in that case. Uh, but commented that in an exceptional case where a long period of garden leave had already elapsed, a court might be justified in declining to grant any further protection. So it's something to bear in mind. Thanks, Meredith. Now, I'm going to move on to a different topic now, which um, is really important for ev- every all of you who are dealing with this, um, you know, at the front end, as it were, um, which is about enforcement of restrictions. Um, because many employers will say to us, well, you know, it's all very well and good having these restrictions on paper, but what can we do about it when we become aware of a breach? Um, and, you know, certainly the survey at the start suggests that some of you have had breaches, but um, haven't, you know, gone forward and taken action. So, Joanne, can you talk to us about the enforcement process? This is a question I get asked very, very often. Uh, For example, what do you do if your best salesperson left a month ago and now you can see from LinkedIn that they've moved on to work for your biggest competitor? Your best client calls you to say they're moving on to that competitor to join them. You had really good, well-written, non-compete, non-solicitation terms in that salesperson's contract to prevent that happening. So what do you do? Well, this is the kind of situation where it's really important to move fast and also really important to get good legal advice because it can get complicated and lasting damage can occur very quickly. Now, these are fundamentally breach of contract claims. You're claiming that the former employee has broken their contract with you. So it's important to act quickly because if damage is being done to your business, for example, your reputation is being damaged, and and employees are leaving in droves, that's very hard to undo after the event. So you want to make sure that you act quickly to preserve any evidence that there might be, like social media posts, for example. So in these kinds of situations, you often seek an injunction. An injunction is an order from the court that someone do something or stop doing something. And it's only really available when money couldn't make up for the harm that could be caused. And that can be the case with restrictions, as it's possible that an employee in breach of them could damage a business in ways that couldn't be repaired just by the payment of money. 
especially by that individual employee who wouldn't necessarily have the funds. So usually I'd say write to your employee to ask them to stop breaching their contract and to warn them that if they don't do that, your next step will be court action. Your next step would be to bring a claim against them for breach of contract. And you'd be seeking an interim injunction to prevent the use of your confidential information or contact with the key clients or whatever the relevant harm is as soon as possible. Now, the court would consider when deciding this application, whether there's a serious issue to be tried, which just means that there's some substance to what you're claiming, where the damages would be an adequate remedy. And you would argue that it couldn't be because the employee couldn't pay the damages or the damages would be too hard to prove or they'd be too hard to quantify. Finally, the court would consider a legal concept called the balance of convenience. And that simply means considering which side would suffer the most if the injunction was or wasn't granted. If that's evenly balanced, then the court will usually favour leaving the status quo. So, for example, if you wanted to stop your former employee from taking a new job, it would be best to act before they'd actually had their first day in that new job. And the parties might in some cases decide it's more appropriate to hold what's called a speedy trial of the whole matter and resolve it properly as soon as possible, rather than applying for an interim injunction pending a full hearing. Now, I should mention also here that while most employment issues are heard in the employment tribunal, in most cases, post termination restriction issues go to the high court. And this comes with significant costs and the risk of paying the other side's costs also if you're not successful. And, um, it, you know, just to give an idea, a recent injunction that I was involved with, costs were about £25,000 for the injunction part of the case. So that will give a very rough ballpark. And what about damages versus injunctions, Joanne? So if you're not successful in an injunction or if financial compensation would be adequate as a remedy, then a claim for damages will come into play. In a damages claim, the court will consider whether the restriction was enforceable, whether the employee actually breached that restriction, whether the employee caused any loss to the employer by that breach, and finally, how much the loss is worth. It used to be common to see what were called root and park damages or negotiating damages, where the damages claimed were essentially the amount that the employer would have accepted to negotiate a release from that obligation. It's a kind of name your price. But after a Supreme Court decision called Morris Garner and One Step in 2018, this isn't usually possible anymore. Thanks. And can you also take action against the new employer or anyone else who, you know, for example, might have more money to actually satisfy uh, a damages mm. claim? Yes, that is often possible. And it could be a good option, given that they're likely to have greater resources than the individual employee. These claims could be for what's called inducing a breach of contract, where you'd claim that the new employer or another third party knowingly and intentionally induced or procured the breach of the employee's contract. This is one of the reasons why you want to make sure that restrictions are brought to the new employer's attention. And you can do this by including a term in the employment contract as part of the restrictions, requiring the employee to divulge them to anyone who makes them a job offer during the restricted period. One other contractual provision that I'm increasingly seeing is an obligation on an employee to inform their employer of any future employment or business plans, including any offers of employment they received at the time they tender their resignation. These clauses can be very effective for several reasons. Firstly, because they act as an additional deterrent to an employee thinking of making a move, which their employer may view as controversial. And secondly, because in practice, they can provide the employer with an opportunity to persuade the employee to stay by offering increased remuneration or other benefits if they view the proposed move as potentially damaging to their interests. And I've personally seen a case this year in which a senior employee was persuaded to withdraw their resignation and not make the move to the competitor due to the employer having offered significantly improved terms. Thirdly, an employer may be in a stronger position in any injunctive proceedings that may prove necessary if it can show that the employee was in breach of this provision in their contract of employment from the outset and therefore that they don't come to the, their defence of the proceedings with clean hands, as it were. So in terms of potential action against the employer, the new employer, there's the tort of conspiracy as well, which can be useful when you're considering action against third parties. 
Conspiracy means two or more people working in conjunction to cause loss by unlawful means. Again, though, all these are very specialised, very technical claims that you would really need to take advice on. Thanks, Joanne. We have one more question and then I'll give you these five golden rules. And um, so do bear with us, even if it means we go over by about two minutes. So just, Joanne, one last question. What happens in practice in your experience? And although sometimes employers do need to go to court, in reality, most of the time it's the threat of those things that's effective and most cases are settled. While every case is different, what most employers do when they're faced with a situation like the one I described is to write to the former employee, probably to their new employer too, and remind them of the restrictions. And sometimes that is enough to stop the behaviour, but you do want to be careful that you don't damage your legal position by any delay. And this approach can also give the employer the opportunity to obtain reassurance from an employee who they suspect may be up to no good, but who actually can provide very clear evidence that they don't intend to act in breach of their restrictions. And I've seen a case earlier this year where thankfully costly legal proceedings were avoided to the benefit of all concerned from taking this approach. Your tougher option is to begin the process of legal action and also seek undertakings that the former employee will observe the restrictions until the matter can be fully tried in court. And undertakings are essentially legal promises to the court or via letters between solicitors where the employee either restates their obligations from their contract of employment or makes bespoke promises relating, for example, to the delivery up of confidential information. And this approach would avoid the need for an interim injunction application and it can often avoid the need to go to court at all because the matter could be settled before it gets to that point. And even if the restrictions are later found to be enforceable, the undertakings will have bought some time to secure those relationships with customers and staff in the meantime. Yeah, and it's it's worth adding there a good deterrent because breach of undertaking can mean going to prison in some circumstances if you've made promises to the court. Um, so hopefully that has been a useful run through of all the key points around restrictive covenants. It is a tricky area. Thanks, Meredith and Joanne, for taking us through all of those. Um, I said I'd give you five golden rules that we sort of picked out. So they are number one, look at the scope of these clauses at the time you are asking the employee to sign them, not with some future date in sight when they might have you know, become an important person in your business. Gauge what's reasonable at the time they're signing them and then frequently update on, um, you know, whenever you get the opportunity to. Um, number two, think really carefully about your business and what it needs protecting from. Don't just use template clauses. Actually have discussions with senior individuals in your business to talk about what does the business need protection from? What are the danger areas? What can you see that might happen in the future? Keep a record of these conversations because they're valuable evidence if you subsequently show that you really did think about um, what protection you needed and how long you needed them for and that sort of thing. So make sure you do that. Consider having different lengths of restrictions, um, either you know, for different clauses, don't just put a blanket 12 months or six months on everything. Think about really you know, how long you need for each particular clause. And also whether, um, certainly I've seen this in, in contracts where you will have a staggered um, length of restriction. So perhaps for the first six months of someone's employment, you don't think you'd you'd need much by way of restriction at all. But after that, you would have expected them to you know, get their foot in with certain clients, etc. And you'll need a longer restriction. So you might have staggered. And again, it shows the court that you've really thought about what you need and not just put some blanket time down. Fourthly, um, fourth golden rule, Anytime you're promoting someone, providing um, in more benefits to your staff, changing roles, paying additional salary, look at that might be an opportunity for you to introduce restrictions and have a look at their restrictions again at that point in time. And then fifth golden rule, as Meredith said earlier, don't breach the contract of employment. If you're going to pay someone in lieu of notice, make sure you actually do it in accordance with the terms of your contract and you've actually got the contractual ability to do that. So those are the five golden rules. 
if any of you want to have a chat on uh, any of this with one of us, please just get in touch, either pop a message in the chat box or follow up with one of us individually. All of our contact details can be found on our website, www.thomasmansfield.com. And we'll be back on the 20th of October with a webinar on managing evolving disability discrimination in the workplace. And you can go to our website to register your interest for that. So please do pop your name down on that. And for now, sorry, we've overrun by five minutes. Um, I think it's the first time we've done it, actually. Um, so that's not too bad. Um, but I'll say goodbye to everyone and thank you for joining us.